Glad to be with everybody tonight. Hope your week is going well. We're studying from the first epistle of the Apostle John. And we started last week with chapter 2, verses 12 through 14. We didn't quite finish that. I spent quite a bit of time on technical matters having to do with uh, the Greek language. I don't like to do that because we have the legitimate translation. You don't need to do that necessarily. But it gives more understanding, and yet it can be something that can cause uh, consternation on the part of those that aren't used to it. But one of the things that we were talking about that I wanted to get across and mentioned that otherwise throughout the New Testament, such is taught, but we're looking at John here, and we want to see what is said in this passage of Scripture. So we looked at... Um, the idea of little children, which he definitely uses as a term of endearment throughout the letter. But then he also uses the term to mean at different stages that uh, members of the church are in as they grow up in Christ. Now, mind you, we're talking about different stages that doesn't mean some are lost some are saved some are unfaithful some are faithful we're just talking about spiritual growth it gives us an insight from the time that a person is born of water and the spirit and is a newborn babe in christ john 3 3 and 5 and galatians 3 27 all the way to becoming a mature person and that's the point that john is making he wants every member of the Lord's church, every Christian, regardless of their maturity or lack of it, to know the joy that he and the other apostles have in their fellowship with God. He wants their joy to be full, as we've emphasized. emphasized. So we pointed out then that he must be using this to a certain extent in this passage in a figurative way, as if people are at different levels of understanding and faith as Christians, such as the babe in Christ or infants in Christ, newborn Christian. We might say uh, being at the stage of, of youth. And he does that more specifically when he says in, um, say, starting in verse 13, I write to you fathers because you have known him. That is from the beginning. I write unto you young men because you have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you, little children, because you have known the Father. I have written unto you, fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abideth in you, and you have overcome the wicked one. I read that last week, and again, I do now, after we've had a discussion, and I hope you remember what we said. There is the stage of of being young, the stage of youth, spiritually speaking. Um, I take the expression here, young men, to be uh, figurative. It refers to all male or female, uh, young or old chronologically, who are what? Strong in the Lord. They're strong in their faith in the Lord. They're strong in their obedience to the Lord. They've overcome, he says in First John uh, 2, if you look in 13 and 14, they've overcome the wicked one. Now, we learn from First John 1, 8, that they are not beyond sin, but they are complete in Christ. They're without sin. Don't forget First John 1, 7. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. Those are present tense verbs in the Greek language. It's, it's uh, linear action. When a person is baptized into Christ, baptized into his death, Romans 6, 3, and 4, then that's where the Lord shed his blood. The blood is applied. And thus that blood continues to cleanse if we walk in the light, season of the light. Light being truth. Remember, uh, light and darkness. Well, we are not of the darkness. We are of the light. We are of the truth. So 
this pertains to a person whether they're a baby in Christ or young men, as he says here, or whether they're more mature. The same thing continues on. Because no one can ever be beyond sin in this life. Now, we're to strive with all the power we have not to violate God's law. He'll say later on, 1 John 3, 4, that sin is the transgression of the law. And he's already said, as we've studied earlier, uh, we're not sin. And when a person in obedience to the gospel of Christ before baptism repents of sin in obedience to Acts 17, 30, that person is resolved in his mind, I no longer will sin to the best of my ability. Yet John says that you can't say you don't sin. The reality of it is, as we're in the flesh, there must be a system of grace and mercy. It always emphasizes that the conclusion of the whole matter is fear God to keep his commandments. But there must be something there that allows for one to grow from a babe in Christ all the way to complete spiritual maturity. And that has to be the blood of Christ through the favor of God, the mercy of God, as the whole gospel system is set up. So we don't reach a stage of never ceasing the possibility of sin. Thus, John would say we have an advocate with the Father if we do sin. So Christ is the only mediator between God and man, and he ever lived to make intercession for us. Well, that's true of the babe in Christ. That's true of the young men. That's true of those who are called fathers here, more mature. So notice that um, their faith, the younger, let's say the young men, had maybe been tested and tried as much as others. Part of the way of growing up in Christ, becoming more mature, is to have your faith tested. And to see just how much confidence do you have in God and his word. Some people find out they didn't have much. The rich, the rich young ruler thought he wanted to go to heaven. Good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? The Lord told him, and he found out he just thought he wanted to go to heaven because he would not comply with the Lord's will concerning what he should do and thereby demonstrate his faith in Christ that he could go to heaven. Well, we have to have things happen to us just like Abraham did when our faith, when his faith was tested. That was for Abraham's benefit. How do I know I'm developing? Well, take a look at Peter. Oh, Lord, I'll never deny you, but he did. And that told him something about himself. And thus he grew even because even when he failed. The person who is faithful to God, the person who stumbles and gets up and starts all over again, that tells you what you made of. That tells me where you need, where I need to work. It shows me weak points, strong points. And thus the person grows in Christ whose faith is tested. And that's one of the things young men, that is young in the faith, have not undergone. I emphasized last week one of the qualifications that one must meet to be an elder in God's church is that he can't be a novice. Well, novice is new at. Uh, thus, a person who's new at something, in this case, living the Christian life, is not to be appointed an elder. Now, that within itself, that very qualification, points out to us there's a need for growth and development. And thus, the blood of Christ continues to cleanse young men or anybody else. But what, what makes the difference? They keep on keeping on. They continue to walk in the light. They continue to face things in the light of the authority of God's word and solve problems accordingly. If they do fail, they back up and start all over again. Peter's a good example of that. So the source of their strength what is? Well, it's the word of God. The seed of the kingdom is the word of God, Luke 8, 11. The sword of the spirit is the word of God, Ephesians 6, 17. Now, the word of God is quick and powerful, meaning alive and active, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing of sons of the soul and spirit, and the joints and marrow. Now, watch it. And is the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. 
Thus, we're taught as Christians, and everybody should, to know God's will for their life, why they're here, what they're to do here, where they're going when life's over. Whoso looks into the first law of liberty and continues therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. James 1.25. Well, that, that can be said to the uh, young people, spiritually speaking. They may be 50 years old, but still a baby in Christ. Or it can be said to the one who is older. It can be said to anybody that's a member of the church, regardless of how mature they are or how lack in maturity they are. So only the word of God is that which abides. It remains. Uh, look at verse 14. You see this very well. Uh, we are strong, he says to them. And he ends up by saying in the latter part of the verse, and the word of God abideth in you, and ye have overcome the wicked one. Now there's the only way that anybody's going to overcome the wicked one is when the word of God abides in us. And that's a very important point to keep in mind. Now, how does the word of God abide in you or me or anybody else? When we take it to heart, when we internalize it, when we use it to discern our own thinking, how do you know you're thinking wrong? You have to know the word of God. It's an objective standard of truth. It doesn't make any difference whether you're male or female, young or old, or whatever. It remains the same. One of the amazing things about the word of God, being the revealed mind of God, is that as you grow in understanding of godly living, being a Christian, one who's all Christ in the Lord's spiritual body, the church, you will see things in passages you never saw before. Well, it's not because it wasn't there. It's because you've changed. You have a different concept. I think one of the saddest things I've seen over the years of living Christian life, and especially as a preacher of the gospel, is to see people who have been members of the church for years, and they haven't progressed at all. They don't seem to have any insights. They don't seem to have a view of this particular life in the flesh on earth as to what it's to be used for. In fact, they seem to be continually seeking to suit themselves no matter what, and they don't look much beyond the physical. So that's not what God's saying. God's not suggesting people like that that may tell them to repent and get back on board. He's talking about people who stick with it. And that brings us again to 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, be you steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Now, that can be said to one who would be called a young man in the faith or anybody else in the church. So as one demonstrates time and again that they are solving things and living their life, in the light of divine truth, they're walking in the light. Then they can progress to what we might call as the final stage, and that is the stage of maturity. And so he addresses five. That's the reason I say I think these things or uh, these terms are figurative. They're not actually talking about uh, a physical father, a father in a family. They're talking about mature Christians. Uh, it likely refers to, in this passage at least, the Christians. And I would say it, it has to do with male and female. They've reached the highest stage of Christian life. Um, I, I'll develop that hopefully a little further. The term itself, father, uh, has to do with uh, their own, well, we say a lot nowadays, life experience. They say a lot about that. You know, I, I would suggest you take note and look very closely at how much the Bible, especially the Old Testament, has to say about older people. Why does it talk about uh, respect for older people? Why does it say things like that? I, I will try to develop it all right here. It's talking about people who have lived life. He's talking about godly people who have solved things in the light of God's truth. People who know what they're getting ready for. First of all, the pilgrims in this world, they know they're just passing through. 
They know they're here to show God they love him. They know they're here to show their faith in God and his system of salvation. So we're talking about them going from infancy, going to young men, as he said, going to full maturity fathers. Um, the thing about it is, is that whatever stage a person is in, in the spiritual maturity, these things can be applied. They uh, certainly, are, as far as I know, the only way anybody's going to go from uh, infancy, spiritually speaking, to old age, if you want to call it that. Notice they have known him who is from the beginning. They have, let me back up and say it this way too. Now, the very fact that he uses fathers, I've said I believe it's their figurative meaning maturity. If they're fathers, they brought forth spiritual offspring. How do you do that? You bring others to Christ by teaching them the truth. I think that can be seen in Paul's own uh, comments about Timothy. He made it very clear that he was Timothy's spiritual father. And that, to me, ties in even more with understanding these terms to be figurative. You're helping people along the way. You've understood better how to do that. Now look at the qualifications of elders, and you'll see that for the most part, they're describing a person who is a practiced Christian, a person who faced problems, a person who solved those problems with the truth, people who have made mistakes, but they've overcome them. They have not quit. They press on to the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. That's what Paul did. So this is the this is the way that one grows and develops to have the mind of Christ, to see things as Christ sees them, to view life in the flesh as we need to. You know, most people just think of things, even though they know death lies out there somewhere. Most people, I'm afraid, just simply still make all of their plans based on a, a really a lie that they're always going to be here in the flesh. That's an amazing thing to me. It doesn't take very long in life to look in the mirror and see that things aren't staying the same way. You don't stay in your youth very long. And so it is that uh, with regularity, we're moving toward the end of this life. And the only way we're not going to see death, Hebrews 9, 27, is that the Lord comes back first so that we're transformed in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump when the world ends, when Christ comes back. But notice these fathers, these mature Christians, have known him from the beginning. Well, I think that's likely referring to Jesus because he was from the beginning. Remember John 1 and uh, verses 1 and 2? Then you've got 1 John 1 and verse 1. So you got both of those that are written by the same apostle, same Holy Spirit inspiring, part of the same New Testament. And Christ himself says in the book of Revelation, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. So is there a distinction being made by John? Well, in 1 John 2, 13, he says, little children have known the Father. And he says, fathers have known the Son. And he's already said he's from the beginning, 1 John 2, 13, 14. So, so maybe it's this, as babes in Christ, it can be said that even in our spiritual infancy, we can and we do know the Father. That is, we have this intimate relationship with him. And we experience the eternal life that you give. Maybe we need to go back and talk to those who, which would be most in this audience, who have been baptized in Christ. Do you remember when you rose from water to the grave of baptism that there was relief, there was the rejoicing, there was the happiness to know you're reconciled to God, you're justified with him, your sins, or past sins are remitted, you're a part of the spiritual body of Christ, you're now under the favor of God. First John 1, 7 comes to bear. Walking the lives he is in the light. 
Well, that's true of the person as soon as they're baptized into Christ for the least of sins and they become Christians. But you appreciate and grow into that even more the longer you live the Christian life, the longer you study the Bible, the longer you face life's problems and the battles of life and overcome them with the truth of God. And we don't have time right here, but this would be a good time if you want to go on your own to go back and read Ephesians 6 and putting on the whole armor of God, uh, learning how to use such as the shield of faith and so on. That all is developed. Paul said of himself at the time he was writing scripture and a long time apostle undergoing many terrible things for the cause of Christ. He said, I have not yet attained, but this one thing, he pressed on to the mark of the prize of high calling. That's always the disposition of the faithful child of God, whether they're a babe in Christ or they're mature in Christ or they're one of the young men, so to speak, in Christ. So it's only with time and opportunity that we grow because we're learning to walk as we walk for John P. Sue. And that's how we come to know Jesus Christ is through putting into practice the mind of Christ. Well, where is that? Well, it's in the New Testament of Christ. Remember, the second half of the Bible is the New Covenant, New Testament. It is the last will and testament of Jesus Christ. How do you know what Christ would want out of you or me or anything else on this in this world? I read his will. And that doesn't seem hard to understand that. Now, while he was on earth, he could do things the way he chose to do it. But once he's dead, gone, raised from the dead and sent him back to heaven, ruled to the right hand of God, the only way I know what his will is, is to read his last will and testament, the New Testament of the Bible. Thus Jesus said, John 12, 48, he that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The words that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. And that's the reason we always advocate studying that Bible, knowing the mind of Christ, seeing things as Christ sees them, examining things in that way. Now, the writer of Hebrews got all over those Jewish Christians because they had had time to be teachers, and yet they hadn't used it properly. So they had to go back to the beginning and start over. And that's the way it can be with us. It doesn't have to be. John's saying it doesn't have to be at all. In fact, it shouldn't be. God doesn't expect us to forever remain babes in Christ or to be weak in the faith. He expects growth and development. But the Bible does address those who are in that state of an infant as spiritually speaking or a young man not as much experience in maturity or a father one who's full of age one who's strong in the Lord it's not by accident that those who are charged with the supervision of a congregation are called elders they are called other things it's not that they're necessarily so old chronologically they can't hardly move it means old in the faith Experience in the faith, mature in the faith, and that's what is involved. We don't see much of that nowadays. We have for a long time in our society, in our culture, where people appreciate the older person. Now, if you go into some cultures today in other parts of the world, uh, they still do. And it's quite an amazing thing to go see such uh, respect. So when you see in Second Peter chapter 3, in verse 18, the Apostle Peter's admonition to grow, when he says, in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, you have to have enough knowledge, have faith in Christ to obey it, to be born into the family of God and to become a babe in Christ. So again, he's saying this, saying uh, with the understanding that once you become a Christian, you're saved, but you're expected to grow in knowledge. And through that knowledge, become closer to God, more experienced, more valuable to the kingdom. And again, this knowledge comes only as we develop. And again, this is another study. What we would call the Christian graces, they're found in 2 Peter 1, verses 5 and 8. 
And remember, I'll say that in passing in 2 Peter 1, 5 through 8, concerning the Christian graces. Peter will say there, if you do these things, you'll never fall. Now think about that for a minute. The babe in Christ can read that. The young men can read that. The mature in Christ can read that. And it all says the same thing to all of them in particular growth and development in the Lord. So, leaving this section, the Christian life has much in harmony than with physical life. I've summed up that way. There are definite stages of growth and development. And only through growth does one pass from one to the other. But now, when growth does not occur, that's a sign of a serious malady. A Christian who's stunted in his spiritual growth is going the wrong direction. So these verses, I think, serve as the basis of our text. And I think there may be some difficulty to them, but that's the best way I can sum up this. And I'll tell you one reason I do is what I've said two or three times already because of what's taught elsewhere in the scriptures. That these, uh, this position I've advocated here is upheld by other scriptures of growing and developing and maturing in Christ. And yet, we're all under the grace of God in the body of Christ, regardless of whether we're babes in Christ, whether we're with more experience, what would be called young men, or whether we're aged or fathers. We're all under the grace of God. That makes the difference, all the difference in the world. So in each stage, there are blessings to be enjoyed. But little children need to become young men. Young men need to become fathers. And we need to keep that in mind. It needs to be emphasized the growth development of all of us. In fact, if that's not emphasized, whether you agree with this particular interpretation, I'll just or not, uh, I don't know how you're going to get people to grow unless you emphasize something like that. And there must be some explanation of what is meant by spiritual growth and development and the difference in someone who qualifies to be an elder and someone who's just been baptized to Christ. There must be a difference. And that difference is age and experience, spiritually speaking. Now, I would like to leave this at this point and go to the next part of it, as time will allow. And that's verses 15 through 17. We'll read that now and then look into it. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Interesting that appears right after he's talking about growing and developing and maturing and going through these spiritual stages of that growth and development. Because he ends up by saying in verse 17, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. That's what we need to know, regardless of whether we've just been a member of the church for two days, 20 years, or 50 years. He that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Now, this also begins to tell us something about several things that we're going to look at. First of all, I want to remind you from 1 John 2 and verse 9, he, he that says he's in the light and hates his brother is in uh, darkness until now. You, you cannot say, well, I love God with all that I am and have, and he means more to me than life itself. But I sure can't stand my brother or my sister. There's something more about that person. It doesn't mean there aren't different degrees of liking people and getting closer to people. Jesus had his inner three, uh, Peter, James, and John, who evidently were closer to him than others, but he was certainly in love with all of them when it came to the proper kind of love that God has for man. Now, there's one sense in which we are not to have love at all. And we just seen it brought out here in verse 15. We're not to love the world or the things of the world. Now, let me pause here and try to drive a great big peg down right there. 
There are a host of brethren who haven't grown very much because I'm afraid they still love the world and the things of the world. I don't know how one grows up in greater knowledge and practice of truth, solving life's problems in the light of the will of Christ, and remains in love with this world or the things of the world. Everything I can see through or experience through my five senses is going to end, even the five senses. It's all going to be done away when the elements melt with fervent heat, the earth also, and the works thereof are dissolved. They're gone. At the end of time, everything that's physical, everything that's material, physical laws included, scientific laws, whatever they are, that is of this world will be gone forevermore. And the question that people need to ask them is, then what? Well, he makes it clear that if you live according to the will of God, you abide forever. So it seems to me that a person who is growing up in Christ, maturing in Christ, is losing attachments with the affair of this world, sees it only as a schoolroom whereby God teaches us to love spiritual things and esteem them very highly over the affairs of this present world. Now, I admit that I don't think anybody could say otherwise, that since none of us have ever experienced the process of the spirit, the real you and the real me, the inner man, leaving our bodies, there's quite a bit of, well, what will that do like? But we who are obedient to the gospel and living faithful to God, trusting in him based on his word, we should above all not be concerned about that to the point of being scared out of our wits. But now the person who's not ready to meet his maker, a person who still loves the things of this world, a person who still loves this world, ought to be afraid, ought to be terrified when they still are in their sins that separate them from God. So we see that we, we are not to love this world or the things of the world. They become tools for Satan to get us to violate God's will. So you see, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. That a part of verse 15. Now, how many of us would say we don't want the love of the Father to be in? And John has already written, I want you to have the fellowship with God that we the apostles have with God. I want you to join, he be full. I want you to walk in the light and see in the light. I don't want you to sin, but I want you to know that if you do, you have a heavenly attorney who pleads your case because he came and lived as a man in the second person of the Godhead, tempted in every point like as we are yet without sin, who ever lived to make intercession for us and pleads our case before the Father. Well, I like that. He's pleading my case saying he belongs to me. He made the choice to obey from the heart the gospel and took me at my word and was baptized in Christ for the mission of sin. And I've added him to my church. He's a part of my spiritual body and he's walking the lies I'm in the light. We ought to all think that way and cultivate that kind of thinking and not think about this world as if we're going to be always in our flesh and body. James says plainly, that life in the flesh is like a vapor that appears for a little while in the natural way. Some of us have lived long enough to look back over our lives and say, well, you know, that was 50 years ago. That was 60 years ago. That was 70 years ago. Seems like just yesterday. And yet we're nearing the end of our days on earth just by reason of observation and common sense. So a very simple imperative is therefore given to us. Love not the world. But we do understand the meaning of this, don't we? We find Jesus saying, or said of God by John in John 3.16, for God so loved the world. Now I'm told not to love the world. God loved the world. And I love what God loved. Well, it's obvious. They're not talking about the same thing. 
Christ, a God, first of all, and Christ, loved the people of the world to the point of doing what he did to save them from their sins, which they could not do. But what he's talking about here is loving this present system of physical things. And that's what we don't love. And he tells us plainly what aspect of it it is. He talks about the matter of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Now, when God created us and put us in a physical world and a physical body, that physical body had needs. It has appetite. To function in this world, it had to be made to function in this world and use the things of this world. But at the same time, you see Satan approaching Eve and he immediately uses these physical appetites to get her to break God's will. So these things can become evil to us if we don't bridle them with the word of God. The strong, one of the strongest appetites of man, sexual appetite. Now, who gave us sexual appetite? God did. Is there anything wrong with satisfying it? No, not at all. He tells us to be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth. But he tells us where to exercise it, where to gratify it. And that's in matrimony, Matthew 19, 6. But now, a multitude of people today pay no attention to that at all. Adultery is on every hand. Fornication is rampant. And now we have to contend with homosexuality, unnatural fornication, and all of that. Well, unless a person is willing to be guided by the mind of his creator as to how to best live his life, there's no telling what he's going to get off into or how he will try to gratify his desires, whether it be sexual or otherwise. So the, the Bible, God's word, rightly divided and applied, 2 Timothy 2.15, is like a governor placed upon, say, an internal combustion engine. It might be able to run far faster than is even good for it. So a governor is placed on it so it won't even destroy itself. Well, what governor do we have? The word of God. But we're free moral agents. We can choose to abide in the truth, which John says we ought to. It means walking in the light, letting God have his way with that. Or we can reject it. Now, he's telling the members of the church, he writes, if you want your joy to be full, if as a babe in Christ or a little more mature person in Christ or a fully grown person in Christ. If you're going to have your joy full and have fellowship with the Father, even as the apostles do, then you're going to have to stay with the Word of God. It guides us all the way through every phase of growth and, growth and development as a member of the church. That's a very important point to understand. So I hope we can go a little further and shed more light on what John's saying here and hopefully motivate us to seriously heed what he commands in this passage. And first of all, we begin, and I'll repeat myself here, as John did, love not the world. You can't get plainer than that. Christians are not to love the world. If any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not any. What does he mean? Lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, pride of life. You cannot give yourselves wholly over to them and expect heaven to be your home. Certainly you can't grow in a spiritual outlook on things. And, and let me say this about the word spiritual. People have this idea of using the word spiritual and they think of Casper, this friendly ghost floating around. And that all it means is simply to be faithful to Christ. A spiritual person is faithful to Christ. A faithful to Christ person is a spiritual person. One is not spiritual if one is not faithful. Now, take what we've already said about what John said, and you see that very clearly. To walk in the light as he is in the light is to live as the word of God said. 
Well, Paul said it this way in 2 Corinthians 5, 7. We walk by faith and not by sight. Sight means the physical senses. You see, he's saying the same thing John did. We don't walk according to the lust of the flesh, lust of the pride of life. We don't walk according to the way things appear to our five senses. We live as the word of God leads, guides, and directs us. And we're steadfast in that. And we're not going to let anything separate us from it. Now, why should Christians not love the world? Well, I think we've already introduced that. But first of all, it's because of what the world is. And we see that in these verses. Again, I want to emphasize, don't miss this. He's not talking about the physical world in which we live. In the sense that we are despised the globe. We are to despise the earth. We are to despise, reject the stars and the old solar system. Not that at all. That's God's creation, Genesis 1 1. And God said in Genesis 1 31, after everything was created in a physical way, it was very good. It's not, this ties in with John 3 16, it's not the human world, mankind. Remember? God loves the world. People. They're all made in his image. He created every one of them. He's the father of spirits. But they have free moral agency. And all of sin comes short of the glory of God. And in doing so, the wages of sin is death. Romans 3.23 and Romans 6.23. God loves the souls, men and women, boys and girls, who are lost in sin. How much so? He gave his only begotten son. So, Rather, it's the world of sin. And I've already explained that in the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. It's the world of evil. Ask yourself, how does evil get in this world? You just think about it for a minute. There's some sort of a devil, some demon, come flying around and roost on your shoulder and enter in through your ear and go to your brain and make you an evil person? No. One becomes evil because they live contrary to the will of heaven. Evil's in this world because that's what people do. They live contrary to the teachings of God. They live in sin. They do as they please. And if that means murdering somebody, some people will do that. If you're like a Stalin or a Hitler, you murder them by the millions. Uh, if it means uh, theft, a lot of people do that all around us all the time. And so on and so forth. False religions, where do they come from? They come from the Bible, properly understood and applied. No. They come from people who will not follow the totality of the Bible teaching on anything. They may follow some of it. But we're not talking about doing some things that please God. We're talking about doing all things that please God. So it's the sphere in which sin and evil dominate. And that's how Satan works. Satan's a real person, a real being, supernatural, but a real being. And Peter tells us he's like a roaring lion. He's our adversary going about seeking whom he may devour. And he can't do it against your will in obedience to God's will. He might cause your death because you won't yield to him. But Jesus says, don't fear him who can kill the body. Fear him who can after he's killed, cast both body and soul into hell. So our eternal reward is not in this life. Not at all. And I think we know that, but sometimes we live as if we didn't know that. And John's saying, I'm writing to you because I know some people get that way because he wrote this to Christians. And he's telling them at whatever phase of growth and development they're in spiritually, then they are to follow this don't love the world. Don't love the things of evil. Don't let your desires lead you to violate God's will, thus sin, and be separated from God. I want to develop this more, and I don't think I'll pursue it right now. 
because we want to look back at what I've already introduced in the lust of flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. And we're nearing the end of the time period for class anyway. So I think we'll pause here. Let me say thank you again for being with us. And I hope these things have benefited you. And before we end the class, we want to go to Heavenly Father in prayer. Thank you, Valerie. Holy Father, help us to be so thankful there are people who love the truth, the people who are striving to know God's will and to do it, that heaven can be their home. We're thankful for thy word. Help us to cherish the Bible and have the attitude to give me the Bible that we might study it, understand it. Help us all to think seriously about the fact we're quickly moving through this life, regardless of our present age chronologically. We're quickly moving toward the end of life. So help us to order our lives according to thy will found in the New Testament, that we might be prepared to stand before thy holy son in judgment and be able to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter ye into the joys of thy Lord. We pray it all in his precious name. Amen.